Welcome, everybody, to Zion Tabernacle. We have a word for you today. And now, here's Eliyahu ben David. Come along, come along. We've got a lot to say. We can all be united as one today. We can all come together. What a sight to see. So come join us in our community. Up to Zion Road. We can all be reconnected. It's what the future holds. Bring us back as one. Foster the people and stand right into this rail. Back to Jerusalem, we're going home on Zion. Come along, come along, come along, come along. We're going home on Zion. Recently, I've been teaching on the Midmar numbers chapter 11. If you've had opportunity to read it recently, what you find there is people becoming very discontented. And the reason that they give is over food issues. And this has caused me to think about the issue of discontent as it relates to food and therefore also to economic issues. This is very relevant to our time, and I want to make some connections with that. Um, And I think as I go along, you'll be able to relate to what I'm talking about. But if you think of economics, you're thinking of something that affects all of us. And then there are spiritual issues that are involved. I'd like to take you back now with my first graphic. um, To 2008. In 2008, on my radio program, On the Road to Zion, I announced that the four horsemen of Revelation had been released. Revelation 6, 5, and 6 tells us what happens when the third seal would be opened. It says, Behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a balance in his hand. I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A conix of wheat for a denarius, and three conics of barley for a denarius. Don't damage the oil and the wine. Well, this was in the summer of 2008 that I said that this horseman had been released. And I told everyone who would listen that that horseman represented global economic crisis that was about to ascend on the world. I got some feedback from people who heard the program. And at that time, the economy seemed to be doing very well. And they all told me how crazy that was. And of course, a short time later, in the fall of that year, global economic crisis descended upon the world. And that's very much in keeping with this black horse rider of Revelation. At that time, too, I pointed out some other things about this uh, passage. It says, a conix of wheat for a denarius and three conix of barley for a denarius. At the time this was written, a denarius was a day's wage for a laborer. And a conix of wheat is about enough for one loaf of bread for one person to eat. So if a man had a family, he wasn't going to be able to get the the wheat. He was going to have to get barley. He could get three conix of barley for his day's labor. 
so that he would be able to feed his family. But barley was what they normally fed to the animals, not to the people. What does this really show? Well, it talks about a lowering standard of living. That's what that's talking about. But it says don't damage the oil and the wine. The oil and the wine, of course, is associated with the wealthy. And it's telling us that they would be relatively unaffected while the working man who earns the denarius would be greatly affected. Well, what has happened since 2008? Has this not been the very story that we have been seeing unfold before our eyes? And what effect does this have on the level of content or discontent of the population of the people in the world, maybe even you? Well, let's consider this. We'll go to our next graphic now. We have here some information from the Census Bureau. And it's very interesting. In 1989, the median household income in America was $51,681. By the end of the century, that amount had risen by less than $5,000, but it had risen. By 2012, it had plummeted back down to $51,017 or less than the 1989 level. If it feels like you have less money in your budget and that that money isn't going as far, well, it's because that's really true. We have some other information here. You notice this section on the shrinking middle class. Interestingly, it points to the year 2008 and it says, since 2008, when the economic crisis fell upon us, the number of Americans who call themselves middle class has fallen by nearly a fifth, according to a survey in January by the Pew Research Center, from 53% to 44%. Now, this is interesting because... People who have conceived of themselves as being middle class somewhat take pride in that and so are slow to admit if they have dropped below the middle class. So seeing here that a significant number have said that has happened means probably a much greater number have actually dropped out of the middle class as it says here, either lower middle or lower class. And there's 40% that now identify with those lower economic levels. Well, I'm not telling you all this just to make you feel depressed. But I'm wanting you to understand why there's a growing level of discontent. We're looking here at economics in the United States of America, but of course this affected the entire world in the global economic crisis and continues to have an effect. And governments in many parts of the world are experiencing the same thing. Populations are experiencing the same thing. Now, let's get some more specific information, not just how people feel about their status, which clearly um, they feel like they're getting poorer. But let's see what statistics we can actually find about this. Here we're looking at a graphic that is illustrating the distribution of U.S. family wealth in the year 2013, which is the last year that these 
figures are available for. And um, interestingly, these figures are from the Federal Reserve Board. So we would expect these figures to be fairly conservative. And in this chart, it has divided everybody up into three sections. So that goes fairly well with uh, the poor or lower economic class in general, the middle class, and the upper class. Now notice how this works out. We have 90% of U.S. families. That's 90%. 9 out of 10 U.S. families. That's a total of 110 million plus households. That 90% of Americans own only 25% of the household wealth in America. That means that the remaining 10% is distributed between the rest. But then when we break that down, we have the middle group. There's 21% of the wealth distributed between about 8.5 million households. That's 21% to that 7% of American families. Now we have the remaining amount, which is 54% of the wealth of the United States of America. That is the household wealth. That is owned by 3% of the population of the United States of America. So 3% own significantly over half of the total wealth in the United States. So we have the 90% that have 25% of the wealth. We have 3% that has 54% of the wealth. How much of a difference is there between how the 90% live and how the 3% live? Can you see why there's a growing disaffection with every aspect of society in America? Why there seems to be growing concern, growing unhappiness among many people? When you look at that, it brings up other questions. For instance, if you look at the political system and the governmental system, you've got 90% of the people with 25% of the wealth. You have 3% of the people with 54% of the wealth. Who are the bureaucrats and politicians going to be working for? in that scenario? Will it be the 90% or the 3%? And doesn't that explain a lot more about how things have been going in the country? And doesn't that explain why things are unlikely to get better anytime soon? Because truly, this 3% has a lock on the system so that even though the majority of people are looking for meaningful change in real ways, um, things just keep sliding more and more in the same direction. And we've seen multiple statistics showing that while the middle class 
keeps getting smaller and everybody in the middle class and the lower class seems to be getting poorer, the people in that top level keep getting richer year after year after year, including the year of the so-called economic crisis, 2008. So this is really a dramatic situation when we look at it. Uh, Forbes magazine breaks this down even more. It says the top 1% own more than 40% of the nation's approximately $54 trillion in wealth. So the top 1% owns 40%. That's why we hear about the 1% a lot. In the news, they talk about the 1% a lot. Because it's perceived that the 1% are getting all the benefits out of the society, and others, by far most of the others, are falling behind. And of course, this is leading to greater and greater discontent now, we see that discontent manifest in a lot of different ways around us today. And that is a whole other story to get into. But we're looking at one of the major reasons why this is happening, why there is so much discontent and even anger on the part of so many people today. Well, let's go on to our next graphic and break this down even a little more. Now this graphic shows even more what is happening. You notice it says the 1% have gotten chump change compared to the 0.1% who in turn have gotten peanuts compared to the 0.01%. And when you look at the chart, you can see what this is really all about. We have the bottom line that's almost right straight across, hardly even registering. And that's the bottom 90%. 90%. That's where those people register on the income scale. Then above that, look at the green line here. This is the top 0.1%. These have come up quite a bit more, as you can see, than the 90%. They have a much bigger piece of the pie than the 90%. But then we have what you might refer to as the super wealthy, the 0.01% that are represented by that blue line. Look at the percentage of the pie that they have. What this is indicating to us is that the flow of wealth is moving in the direction of the super wealthy. Along the line, those who are almost there are benefiting. Those who are almost where they are, they're benefiting. But the super wealthy, uh, they are being glutted with wealth. And the effect of the global economic crisis on them has been to cause them to be excessively, obscenely more wealthy than they've ever been. When you look at this chart and you see the movement of this blue line, uh, this is absolutely astounding. To imagine such a great amount of wealth to be in a few hands when many, many people are truly suffering right now. Many people are losing their homes. 
where is the wealth from those homes ending up? Look at the chart. Where is all the loss that people are suffering ending up? Look at the chart. It's telling you what's happening. Let's go to our next graphic. This graphic is simply a screenshot, the first half of it is, from Amazon of a, a book that is sold on Amazon that was, or may still be for all I know, the number one bestseller, a book on economic theory by an economist named Thomas Piketty. The name of the book is Capital in the 21st Century. This book is making waves. Uh, this is quite technical. It's based on probably the greatest amount of economic data all brought together on this subject ever assembled by anybody. This is on um, very, very solid ground. And the implication of all of this data as reported in this book is that there is a dynamic at work in the system, in the economic system, regarding the accumulation and distribution of capital that basically shows that capital, in other words, invested money, is returning far more than labor is. So, the result of this is the people who have the most money to invest are getting dramatically more return. And the result of this is that what we've seen has been happening in these graphics I've shown you is really just the beginning of a much bigger drain of wealth on the world. In other words, a siphon has been set up by the super wealthy, kind of like a vacuum cleaner, an economic vacuum cleaner, suck the dollars out of the pockets of the world. Well, just how bad is this? The economist who wrote this book, Thomas Piketty, says that the inequality in America today is the worst, get this, the worst in world history. The difference between common slaves in Rome and the wealthiest Romans is not as great as the distance between the 90% and the point zero one percent. He says that for those who work for a living, the level of inequality in the U.S. is, quote, probably higher than in any other society at any time in the past, anywhere in the world. Now, seeing as the United States is the financial capital of the world, what does that say for the rest of the world? When people say, well, this has always happened, that we've always had booms and busts and so on, that's true. But is that the same as this? The black horse riding was the point really where this disparity we're talking about tipped the scales. And the backlash of all of that 
came back on the whole economic system. And we've all been suffering from it ever since. And the results of this have been varied. It's had huge impacts on families, on relationships, on health, on so many different things. And America, despite this huge disparity, is a wealthy country compared to many other places in the world that have felt this even worse than here in America. So these economic factors cause growing discontent, and if the data and the experts are to be believed, this is only the beginning. This is not going to be corrected. Because the people that are responsible for this are so wealthy and they are able to command so much of the world's resources and therefore so much political power that it's almost politically impossible to really change the system as they have created it that is draining all of this wealth from the people. So where is all this going to end? Well, some of the wealthy people have been asking that question. I think we'll look at our next graphic. Could America's wealth gap lead to a revolt? That's from Forbes magazine. We have a couple of other headlines from various business magazines on the same topic. Now, these are only three that I picked out of many that I was able to look up instantaneously on Google. If you were to Google this, um, I think I put in um, wealth inequality and came up with all this. It's a growing problem, and this is the reason it's a problem for the wealthy. Because historically, when... This gap has gotten too great between the poor and the super wealthy. Heads roll. They're wealthy heads that roll. We're reminded, for example, of the French Revolution, right? Just one example that comes quickly to mind. So, as you look at this, what you note is that while the average person is continually told that the economy is getting better, there's more jobs available. Um, Basically, we're constantly fed propaganda and pablum telling us that we're going to have a better life. But in the business journals, the people that are making all the money, what are they worried about? They're worried about the day when the average person in the 90% says, hey, wait a minute. What are these people doing? And when that reaches a critical mass, bad things are going to happen. So how does the future really look? You see, this is built into our system. It has become an oligarchy that is ruled by the rich. They're not going to let it change. So, there's really no reason to believe that there will be any significant change. The UN keeps publishing a report on world happiness. 
to try and convince all of us that we can all be happier. And of course, one big idea is that if you're not happy, you're mentally ill, and therefore you need to take drugs. And they want to push more drugs on the 90%. That is their solution to the happiness problem. Now, friends, you might not like hearing me tell you about this. You might think that I'm a terrible pessimist and an awful guy and I'm destroying the chances for your future simply by telling you this. But I didn't write all of this. I just showed you real statistics, real information as to what is at the root of the problems. You know, the scriptures say the love of money is at the root of every ill. I'm paraphrasing with that. But I think we have a situation in the world today that proves that is true. And what comes out of that greed? Well, we looked at the possibility of social unrest and revolt. And we've seen that in different places around the world. You know, here in America, we don't see all of the riots and things that happen in Europe and other parts of the world. That's underreported in America. If you happen to be watching this from some other place, perhaps in Europe, maybe in South America, maybe other parts of the third world, uh, you probably know better than we Americans do how much this is really happening already, how much revolt has really been going on, civil unrest. This is our future in this world. So if you're feeling discontented and unhappy, chances are somewhere at the root of that is something that's not what you did. One thing that the system wants to do is they want to tell you it's your fault. It's your fault you lost the good paying job and now you're working flipping burgers. Or maybe not working at all. It's your fault. But is that really what's happening? See, there's economic forces at work that have done this to people. And so, of course, people feel upset. People feel concerned. They have anxiety. We have certain resources that other people don't have one of the smartest people in the world, has said that he expects global destruction to come on this planet at some time within 200 years. And so that's why he thinks that um, we need to move into outer space. Is this an answer? Then if we go into outer space and we go to another planet, let's just say we could succeed at that. How long before we would bring the same disaster there that we're bringing here? The smartest people in the world don't have answers to these problems. And you know the underlying problem we're talking about here is greed. Because once you have trillions of dollars, do you really need another trillion? And yet they're never happy. No matter how much they have and no matter how much misery people have. And you know what they want to tell you? They want to tell you it's because of overpopulation. Where the truth is, if you look at the amount of wealth available, 
there is more than enough wealth for every person on this planet to have everything they need and more. It's just that the vast majority of it is in the pockets of a relatively few people who are hoarding everything they can get their hands on. Now this is the truth. There is no overpopulation. There's just wickedness and greed that is basically taking over the planet. That's what's really happened. Well, what I've been teaching people about is Bible prophecy, among other things. And what I believe, what I teach is that these things are all coming to a head at this time because we are living at the end of this age that was foretold by the Son of God and by all of the prophets in the Scriptures. And all of the things that were foretold are rapidly coming about. Now, the evolutionists, the atheists, and many other people who have bought into all of the propaganda will scoff at that. But my question is, how much do they know about that? How many times have they even picked up a Bible in a serious way to consider what its message is for our time? And if we have gotten into this much trouble following those people, is that what we still want to do? If what they're doing is taking you to the poorhouse, are you going to continue to listen to them? Are you going to continue to believe them? Why are they telling you that stuff? They are trying to placate you. They are trying to dumb you down so that you won't know what the truth is. But the truth is there. Our Heavenly Father has preserved it for us so that in the midst of the great darkness we are truly in in this world, there is a light to give us the truth. Now, the main thrust I want to get to in this particular discussion is not Bible prophecy. But I would feel remiss in talking about all these things without telling you there is hope. But the hope does not come from this world. The great people of this world, the wealthy people of this world, the kings, the queens, the noblemen, the presidents, they're all a part of the conspiracy to steal your last dollar. And what about the professors and the scientists? that you think are so great? Where do they get their funding? Where do they get their grants for all their research? Where do they get their money for the foundations that endow their august places of learning? Where does all that come from? Isn't it from these very people that we're talking about? that are greedily sucking up the world's wealth? What do you think you're going to get from those people? The truth? Just because they put something in what sounds like scientific language to you doesn't make it true. If you want the truth, you need to go to the author of truth. The author of truth is our creator. He can't be bought by the greedy elite of this world. He's got no reason to lie to you.
everything that he has told us points to this generation as the final generation. And he does have a plan. And there are people right now that know what his plan is, that are believing him, trusting him, working along with him towards that plan. There's no reason to be discontent. There's no reason to be afraid or anxious over the future. He's got it all under control. And he has a plan for those who love him. And that's who his plan is for. The people that love him. The people that listen to him. The people that believe him. The last time the world was in this much trouble, there were eight people in the world that fit that description. And he made a way out for them, which is called Noah's Ark. And I'm not talking about that crazy Noah in the movie. I'm talking about the real Noah, the man of faith, found here in these scriptures. You know, it's not that much to read, okay? It's just a few chapters in Genesis. Take some time and read it and find out who that man was. That's who you have to be if you're going to get through this time. If you're willing to do that, then there is hope for you to get through this time. If you're just going to f- follow the same losers that brought us to where we're at, well, don't expect to have a good outcome. Well, enough about that. What we're going to talk about now is how do we deal with the stress? You know, here in the last days, we have growing stress. A lot of it comes from this economic situation that I have been laying out. And it causes discontent. Now, it happens in very overt ways that we've talked about, like losing your job, being locked into a job you don't want, but being afraid really to leave it and go to something else. Uh, Many, many different things like that that cause stress and discontent. But it's affecting us in other more subtle ways. Like, you know, you go to the grocery store. You're shopping for your family. And, you know, you pick up the packages. They make them look the same, but they've got half as much in them. You read the list of ingredients of things that used to be good, wholesome food. Now all it is is full of chemicals and fillers. It's not good food at all. They have been pulling such a shell game on us. Well, on some level, you are aware of that. And all of that goes to causing more and more discontent. And, of course, when there's discontent, dissatisfaction, and anger, that's infectious. That spreads. Pretty soon you're going to be feeling that way. So there's a lot of pressure today towards even faithful people, believing people, to get caught up in this wave of discontent that is deepening more and more uh, in America and really around the world. We don't have to live like that even in the midst of these troubled times. We have more available to us. If you don't have a relationship with the Son of God that is an effective relationship, and you want to know more about how to establish that kind of relationship so that you can get through these troubled times and be on the right side of that? Well, that's not the main thing we're talking about right now. 
But we have that information, so contact us. We have a lot to help you to establish that relationship that you need to get through. Here in the book of Philippians that we're turning to now, Philippians chapter 4, it's actually writing to people who already have that relationship. People that already believe in Yeshua Messiah, and more than that, have received his spirit to live inside of them. This, of course, is the only answer. More drugs isn't going to do it. Believing all the lies of this world, that's not going to do it. Having some therapist hold your hand for an hour and tell you it was your parents' fault, that's not going to help you either. Here's what can help you. The Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, In nothing be anxious. Well, that sounds impossible. Uh, But we haven't finished reading the verse, have we? It says, In nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to Elohim. You see, when those anxieties come up, don't just keep turning that stuff over in your mind, in your heart, stewing on it, getting more and more anxious, more and more concerned, more and more discontented. If you're a believer, you have a better solution than that. And that solution is prayer. Prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Prayer is that connection with God where you can talk to him, he will hear you, and he can even answer you. That's where the petition comes in. If you are in in right relationship with him, you can petition his throne for the things you need. I said need. I didn't say want. I'm not promising you you're going to get everything you want. The Israelites in Numbers chapter 11, they wanted all the food they used to eat in Egypt. And that didn't grow in the wilderness where they happened to be traveling. So they had a wonderful substitute that... God had given them to get them through that period of travel. And so they didn't need the things they wanted, and yet the things they wanted and lusted after led them into discontent and disaster. That can happen to you. If you have your heart set on things that you want instead of what you need, and you're upset with God because he's not fulfilling those wants, Well, you need to learn how to be content. You need to learn how to see and appreciate how he will give you what you need. He doesn't always stop there. He gives good gifts. Is that thing that's in your mind that you feel you need so big in your mind that you are not thankful for all the other many blessings you do have when you go to him in prayer. And thank him for all the many things that you have that are blessings in your life from him. Doesn't that put it in perspective? That certainly helps. That's how we are to let our requests be made known to him. We can bring them to him Let our request be made known to him and keep praying until you get to that place where you feel you have been heard and you can let go of that thing that you're praying about and leave it with him in faith. Now, once you've done that, do you need to be anxious about it anymore? 
Do you need to be discontent about it anymore? No, because you know your Father who loves you has heard you. It says if you do this, the peace of Elohim, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your thoughts in Messiah Yeshua. Do we understand what that means? It means that there is shalom. There is peace that comes from Elohim, our Father in heaven. And it's a real thing. It's not just a feeling. It's something real that comes from Him. And that's why it surpasses all understanding. This peace does not come out of having things go your way. That's not what it's about. That if things are going your way, you feel peace, but if they're not, then you don't feel peace. You see? This is peace that surpasses all understanding. It's above all of that. It's on a whole different channel, if you will, than all of that. That peace then will guard your heart. Your heart, which is the seat of all of your emotions, your feelings. When you have that peace, you have the discontent, you have the fear, you have the anxiety. You see, when you have that peace, it guards your heart from all of that. Well, listen, that is really guarding your real heart. Because what happens from all of those things? all of that anxiety. Doesn't it go right to your heart? You could end up dead on a table because you're too anxious. That peace from Him could actually save your real heart and with it your life. And it says it will guard your thoughts in Messiah Yeshua. Do you exercise any control whatsoever over your thoughts? I think most people don't even know they can. Well, we need to learn some self-control, even over our mind. If you just keep thinking over all of the troubles that you have, all of the things you're anxious about, then don't be surprised if you're anxious and discontented. Instead, take those things to Elohim. Make your request known to Him. Receive peace from Him. And then, through that peace, guard your thoughts from entering back in to all of that anxiety and discontent. Now, here's how Paul puts it. Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, Whatever things are honorable, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is any praise, think about these things. That's what controlling your mind is about. Thinking about good things. You know, just these words change how you feel. True, honorable, just, pure, lovely. Good report, virtue, praise. Just hearing those words makes you feel better. Control your mind to dwell on those things that are good. And it will improve your life. It will improve who you are. It will improve what you do. And you can't feel discontented while you're thinking about those things. Finally, Paul says, the things which you learned, received, heard, and saw in me do these things, and the Elohim of peace will be with you. Do you know someone in your life 
who truly has faith, someone who walks in faith, someone who lives the way we're talking right now, someone who has even faced adversity and come through it better and stronger, and their faith has come through it better and stronger. Do you know any people like that? Well, if you do know anybody like that, then do what they do. Talk to them. Ask them. They'll help you. They'll tell you. Listen to what they say. Do what they do. And then the peace of Elohim will be with you. This is why we have fellowship together between people of faith, that we can build one another up in faith, that we can encourage one another, that we can help one another. This is such a great boon to us when we are around people of real faith. And this is something that can really help us with this issue of discontent. So where does this leave us? Does this solve the world's problems? No, it doesn't solve the world's problems. I don't expect in the least that the world's problems are going to be solved by the world. Do you think they are? So what do we have to expect? More problems in the world. More troubles in the world. The crisis in the world will get worse. There will be more wars. There will be worse economic problems instead of better. Worse social ills instead of better. But here's the question. Should that make me unhappy? See, I can't change the world, but I can change me. I have everything I need in His Word to get through troubled times. He has promised that He will be with me no matter what happens. And I know it. I believe it. So I'm optimistic about my future. I have a hope that goes beyond anything that can happen in this world. So I'm not unhappy. In fact, I'm very happy. And I am going to see my heart's desire fulfilled. I'm going to see all of this changed. The Scriptures tell us that the Son of God is coming soon. And He is going to take control over this world. And He is going to judge the wicked that are causing all of this trouble in the world, and he is going to establish a righteous government in this world, the kingdom of Messiah. And that is when all the problems will be solved. The greedy people of this world will not be able to buy off the king. He will know what everyone is doing. He will know where the evil is truly coming from and he will put a stop to it. That's what's coming. That's what I put my hope in. You can put your hope in that too. If you're a person who doesn't really know much about the Scriptures, please stop by our website. We've got lots and lots and lots of information to help you understand what the Scriptures really say, to help you to be happy in the last days. Come along, come along, we've got a lot to say. We can all be united as one today. We can all come together and what a sight to see. So come and join us in our community up to Zion Road. Foster the people and scatter breath into this rain. Back to Jerusalem, we're going home.